Maybe I should make introductions. So we have Caitlin Crowder uh, uh, joining us, and Paul Clark, who will be your lecturer next week. So be sure to say hi to them, and you'll hear lots more from them. <coughs> so this morning, uh, so yesterday, I was talking to you in general about parallel paradigms. Now we're going to focus on parallelizing tree codes. I will be using the example of this particular uh, parallel tree code and this particular parallel language that is Charm++, plus plus, but be, uh, be aware that the techniques are generally applicable and, and I've, I've certainly borrowed techniques from, from other codes to uh, in, in the process of building this. Uh, Looking for the AV guy, making sure the mic is doing. Is the mic doing its thing? I mean, you all can hear me. I'm just making sure that the video works. Uh, yeah, okay, it, it's on. Okay, it should be fine. Uh, so, so Changa, uh, you've used it already. Be aware that it was built by a cast of thousands, both uh, 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 people working with me in the Embody group. And I got a lot of help from the Parallel Programming Lab at uh, University of Illinois, uh, the, the folks that, uh, that uh, designed Charm++. Okay, so in order to do this, I'm going to uh, start with a basic tutorial about Charm++, and you can compare it with MPI and OP OpenMP, which I talked about uh, last time. And this is based on a tutorial that the, that, that the group put together. And then uh, after that, then I'll talk about the architecture of Changa and how we use uh, techniques in Charm++ to build uh, uh, Changa. Uh, and that last point, <laughs> we've already covered. I don't need to. I meant to take it out. Okay. So what is Charm++ as a parallel language? It's actually not so much a language, but an extension of C++. And the key component is not so much the language syntax, but the, the runtime system, which I'll uh, explain in detail in a little bit. Um, and, the, and the idea of the runtime system is that you, you do the job of decomposing your problem into parallel bits. And the runtime system does the job of placing them on, on processors. And then the communication paradigm is sort of like MPI, but not quite. It's actually remote method inv invocation. So you call what appears to be a method of an object. It really sends a message to another object, which may or may not be on another processor uh, asynchronously. That means that uh, the method invocation immediately returns, much like an iSend does in M MPI. And you can continue to work while that other object is doing its work in parallel. Okay? And so there, there, the runtime maps all these objects to the processors. It tries to keep equal amounts of work on the processors across the machine uh, and, and schedule those, those, those uh, messages, which are really um, uh, method invocations. Okay, so more pictorially, uh, your your program is a collection of objects. I, I'm hoping people are, are at least familiar with uh, <laughs> the terms of object-oriented uh, programming. If you if you haven't used C++, a lot of you are using Python, and the concept of objects and, and methods uh, are, are there in Python as well. So you've, you've got these objects, uh, and among these objects are, uh, are, are a special class of object, and they're special in that they have, they have uh, names that are globally visible. Uh, that is, that we can address this object no matter what processor I'm sitting on in the parallel machine. Uh, and, and, and they're, yeah, they're accessible, and they have names that you can refer to. And, and under the hood, these 
objects could appear uh, on, on any any processor. So, so you, you're sort of abstracting away from the parallel machine so you don't have to think about individual uh, processors. And so the way you use those objects is that you invoke a method. So uh, object A wants to have object G, uh, G do something, it will call the method G.M2, which so this is a, 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 a method of G. And what's really happening when it calls this uh, particular method is that a message gets sent from uh, A to G. If they're on the same processor, that's a trivial operation. It's more like a, an actual function call. But if they're on another processor, un unknown to you, or, or hidden from you, an actual message gets sent across the network and, and, uh, and starts the, the work going on on object G. Okay? And so from A's perspective, I can refer to G whether it's a local that is residing on the same processor or not. Okay. But I understand that if I do call this method, uh, it is, um, I could invoke a, me uh, a message. And so it, it, this is the way in which uh, Charm++ plus plus, uh, exposes some transparency. Uh, I referred to this before. You, you know that if you call this remote method, you're going to invoke a communication cost. Right, so, uh, so you can look at the performance of, or understand a little bit of the performance of your program just by uh, looking at the number of remote uh, method uh, calls. Uh, and then uh, why, why do we have asynchronous methods? So imagine, uh, and this is, you know, in a serial program, this is usually the way you, you expect things to happen. If I invoke a method, I expect that method to execute and give me a result, right? And then I can continue computation. If I have that expectation, then you have this performance issue that what do I do while that method's invocating? Well, I just wait around for it to, re to return. And so you have this idle time and you have this, you also have this latency issue. You, uh, the, the, it takes time for the message to get to the uh, remote processor and it takes time for the result to get back. So instead, the paradigm is the following, that you invoke the method, the execution begun, uh, begin, well, is scheduled, I should say, remotely, but you can continue executing. Right, so it's asynchronous so that you can be operating in parallel and then you only have this idle time that represents the difference between the, the work you can do locally and the, and the work you've asked to do uh, remotely. Okay, uh, uh, questions about how that works? Again, uh, you can think of the MPI ISEN as a, as a uh, similar paradigm, immediate messages. Okay, and then sort of underneath the hood, what's going on is that these messages are actually ending up in a, in a queue. So you have, say, a bunch of objects uh, sitting on your processor. Those, when you do that remote method indication, what happens is that a message gets uh, stuck into a scheduler queue, and then there, there, there's a scheduler which decides which ne uh, message next to, uh, to execute and discovers and figures out which object and, and then starts the actual computation on the, the object associated with that message. Okay, so. Uh, the other thing about this is that these methods are, are actually uh, executed, uh, well, 
what this system is, is essentially what's known as a user level thread uh, system. Uh, the advantage here, so you're, you're switching between the, the, shall we say, the context associated with all these objects, uh, but you're doing it at the user level. The advantage there is that you start executing a method, you will finish the method, and the system isn't going to preempt you or change the data underneath you. Uh, within your method, everything looks serial. And so you don't, in general, have the uh, race conditions that you would have with system level threads, which is how OpenMP, that's how you run into race conditions with OpenMP. The, the system switches uh, contacts underneath you and your data changes uh, due to another thread executing. Okay, so again, the execution model is this message driven or data driven. So the way you need to think about your program is not so much the flow of uh, execution, but the flow of data. That is, uh, in order to update my positions, I need to know the velocities, I need to know the forces. And so you can string that data dependency into a string of method invocations, and therefore, by following the data, uh, or well, it's the data flow that, that's driving the, the execution of the program. Um, okay, so once you've got your program mapped out uh, like this, it's the runtime's uh, job to uh, place these objects on uh, processors. And so these special globally visible objects have the property that they can be transparently moved between uh, processors. And the runtime will do that for you automatically, or, or you, can, you can do it manually, but generally the, uh, the runtime system automatically uh, moves these, these objects around. And of course, in order to do that, it's got, to keep tra it's got a system of keeping track of what objects is where. Uh, and this is a key component for load balancing, okay? And, and um, as we'll see, so load balancing. Um, so usually uh, how, well, certainly how I did it with, uh, well, Yoakum did it with gasoline, the way we would load balance our computation was we'd have a cost model as we would essentially count up the number of floating point operations we needed to do for given, given uh, gravity calculation. And then we would do a, um, an optimization across the processors to make sure, based on our floating point count, um, each processor had a, 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 an equal number of floating point operations to, um, to consider. And that works if your cost model is accurate, all right? And, you know, even the way we did it, we, 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 you know, we sort of instrumented the code to count up floating point operations. But, you know, we didn't count everything, all right? We didn't count in the cost of memory accesses, uh, extra communication. And so uh, doing that way, is a, building a completely accurate cost model is uh, at best tedious uh, and, and, and very hard to get complete. And so what we do with uh, uh, Charm is, uh, is actually be a little bit more dy dynamic about it because it has a load measurement uh, infrastructure. So we actually measure the cost that uh, computation cost of a, and communication cost of a particular object, and we can use the measured cost to do the, um, to do the uh, load balancing, rather than depending on a, uh, a cost predicted uh, for the model. 
uh, by, by some, some model. Okay, so the key part is a, a load measurement uh, uh, system. Okay, and then uh, in order to structure a, pro, uh, a, a program, you do need some higher order constructs, which uh, Charm provides. Um, the, so just like you have, um, uh, right, re you represent, well, in MPI, you've got a number of ranks, okay? Uh, or, or, sorry, a number of tasks that are given a rank number. You can uh, have an array of objects, and you can think of these as virtual processors. Uh, but t typically, the dimension or the, the length of the array is something much greater than the number of processors you have. It's um, because you'll have many, many objects per, per processor. And, uh, uh, and you can structure these arrays uh, in 1D, 2D, 3D, uh, or you can have a, a general unstructured array. You know, you could index your array by, by character names, right? Uh, as long as you could basically can turn it into uh, an integer. And uh, the, these arrays could be either sparse or, or, uh, or dense. And this is just, uh, all right, you've got uh, several higher order abstractions here that you can use so that you can match, match your algorithm, okay? Uh, and then something that, that, that I, I use because sort of data or memory space is scarce is you can have shadow objects. So this is a separate object that follows the data of your object around so that I can have separate flow control, um, for example, doing SPH separate from a gravity. Uh, I use these uh, shadow arrays. Okay, so those are the uh, objects uh, that you also have communication abstractions. Invoking a method is exactly like the point-to-point -point communication in MPI. Send, well, sends. Um, uh, you don't really have a receive. Uh, you also have the, the, the other uh, collective operations that I, I talked about yesterday. Uh, uh, broadcast, send a message to the whole collection or a subset of the collection. Uh, a reduction, which I explained uh, yesterday, can also be performed with the objects. Uh, and just like MPI, right, you don't worry about optimizing the broadcast or the reduction. The runtime system has some sort of spanning tree or something like that that will, that will make the data collective data communication uh, efficient. Okay, so uh, just the, the picture you should have is that is over here, right? So this is the programmer's mental picture of, of the parallel system, uh, collection of objects. In this case, we've got three different char arrays, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, they're indexed by by their elements, C happens to be a two-dimensional array, and they invoke each other's methods. And we don't worry about the number of processors. The runtime system turns this into this, where it maps the objects onto a particular processor. And some method invocations are local, that are very similar to a function call, except it's asynchronous. And then some, some methods are across processor boundaries. And the way it works across processor boundaries is sort of illustrated down here. So uh, we have this particular method. C12 wants to invoke a method on B of 0. This is what you think about. Under the covers, what the system does is it first goes to a location manager. Well, where is B of zero? 
And I say, oh, it's not on this processor. It's on processor 3. So a message is sent to processor 3, stuck in processor 3's schedule, scheduler, and then eventually gets executed. Again, that's sort of how it works under the covers. You don't have to think about it. You think over here. You know, with the exception that, again, when you make a remote method invocation, you know you're invoking a communication cost. And so you know, OK, this is where I have to be careful in, in limiting the number of messages that I produce. There's also a uh, special class of char arrays which aren't migratable uh, called groups for individual processing elements or node groups, which refers to an entire SP node. Uh, I found these useful because you can, these are great places to store data that say read only. And so if you've got a 100 megabyte cooling table, I don't want to carry that around with each object. I can just have one copy of that cooling table on each SMP node. And so I'll store it in a uh, node group. And, and be, but be aware, if you're a node group, right, that's one SMP object which could have multiple threads running because it's uh, SMP. And so this is probably the only place in Charm++ that you actually have uh, race conditions to worry about everything, all the other objects are essentially uh, operating, the methods themselves are operating in serial. Okay, so like MPI and OpenMP, let me give you just a quick e example of how you put a program together. Uh, the first thing you have to do is declare the uh, you, one of your, or declare the special classes of objects. And there's a special CI file, the, the charm interface file, which has uh, a very C-like syntax. But, uh, but these special declarations that, that hello is a special kind of object. It's this char array which can be seen in the global address space. Okay, and it has uh, two methods. It has a constructor for all right, a C++ constructor, and we've got a, uh, a, a, a another method. Uh, of course, there's uh, there was one special object, the main uh, object, which, uh, as you might imagine, where the program starts. Okay, so with that interface file, you then as you see, this is C++. Uh, uh, I have my uh, hello object, which is derived. Uh, there should be an underscore there. Uh, derived from the charm base class hello. Constructor, very, uh, that's obvious. Note there's, there will be a special type of constructor. This is the constructor you, that gets called if an object gets moved from one processor to another. Okay, so that, normally you don't have that in C++. But you might want to do something special uh, when you get moved. Uh, and, and so, and again, the, the, so, and then the, this simple method. And so the flow code uh, control the program is we construct the, an array of these hello objects and then here's how we, how we refer to methods in that global array. Uh, basically you just use uh, array indexing refers to the first element. If I remove the index, that is if I just said p dot print hello that's actually a broadcast. It would invoke the, the print hello method on every single uh, element of the, of, the hello, of, of the hello class. And then, and then the other thing is once this print hello is uh, done, this entire uh, method's done, right? This, this print hello returns uh, immediately. 
and then you see how we, uh, how it, right, this is a very simple serial loop here. If, uh, if my index, that is my array index, is equal to the array size, I finish. Otherwise, I call the next uh, object uh, in the next position of the array. So I, this just loops through the array. And so you get array size uh, print statements. Okay, again, a very simple example, but just showing the syntax here is, is just like uh, C++ and it's uh, with just, you know, array indexing. So, uh, questions about this? Uh, all right, so there's a little bit of magic in getting and uh, an object from one processor to another, right? You've got to send all that, the object's data across the network. And there's a special infrastructure for that called the PUP for pack unpack infrastructure. And that, uh, uh, so if you have a class that has a number of attributes that you want to preserve as the object gets migrated, you've got to tell the system to, uh, to save those and restore those. And that, that involves writing a special routine that uses C++ operator overloading. So it looks kind of magic, where for every data item, you pop, pack, unpack uh, the, the corresponding uh, item in this routine. And, and, but uh, as you can see, it's, kind of, it's very straightforward. So, uh, so it's this routine, will pack or will unpack, depending on what the runtime system passes it as an argument. And so you, you don't, so one routine does uh, both, uh, both tasks for you. And Can I ask you a quick question about this? So how is this calculation included in the load balancing calculation? In the sense that, you know, if, well, you, if you have a loading balancing, you want to do a lot more packing and unpacking, but that obviously is expensive. Right. So, right, so this is, this is a method of the class, which is also measured okay. as CPU time. And there's a, sever, a separate measurement of the communication. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so those are bitwise ORs. Those are C++ overloads of the uh, of the bitwise OR operator. Yeah. yeah this all, uh, so this is data. This is non-transparency, right? This is why operator overloading in C++ is a bad idea, right? Uh, gee, that looks like a bitwise OR. No, it's not. It's a, it's a you know some function call that packs bits. Yeah, yeah, so this is a, a good example of non-transparency. You know, right, this, right, this, this uh, pipe operator could, whatever, solve an NP-complete problem, right? <laughs> and you wouldn't know it. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, so a, a special function call is represented by the, uh, by that pipe operator. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Okay, so, uh, how does this load balancing work? Okay, so what we do is we're gonna take a measurement of the load uh, at one point in the program and we're gonna use that measurement to load balance for, say, the next time step. What that requires is something called persistence. This will only work if the load in the previous step is related to what you're about to do next. And that's what this principle of <coughs> persistence is about, okay? Now, your first thought is, you know, I'm doing a dynamic simulation. You know, the, the costs are going to change as, we, as the particles move around. Uh, but despite that, well, things are only going to change slowly. Uh, if I'm taking reasonable time steps. And so this still could uh, work 
uh, if we have s slow and small changes. It will also work in this first instance. Well, if it only changes abruptly but not very often, in between those abrupt changes, we can, uh, we can expect to get decent uh, load balancing. Okay, and again, the way it does it is we, the runtime has, you know, checks the CPU clocks and things like that, and makes measurements of the actual CPU usage and the communication volume, and then uses it and stores all that in, in the database. Uh, and then you can decide using what's in the database uh, what strategy you could use to distribute that load across the processors. Okay, so that was a quick overview of what Charm++ is about. And you already know how to compile uh, and run Charm++ programs since you've uh, been doing it this week. Uh, I want to delve now into how I use those language features and, uh, uh, to parallelize uh, Changa. Uh, uh, and j just one point here that uh, if I can migrate a process from a processor to a processor, I can also migrate a, a uh, object from a processor to the disk drive. Okay? And migrate all my objects to the disk drive. I can, whatever, power off the computer and then power it on again, migrate all those objects back into memory and start execution exactly where I le left off. So checkpointing is, I wouldn't say trivial, but um, uh, straightforward uh, with uh, Charm++. Okay, on to parallelizing a tree code. Uh, the way we decided uh, to do it is to essentially take vertical slices of the tree and stick, uh, and, and, and each object has a small vertical slice of the tree. So at the bottom of the tree, it has a collection of particles and the uh, leaf nodes associated with those particles. But as well, it also has all the ancestors of those leaves all the way back to the, to the root node. All right, so this is a tree piece that each uh, object, and I have a, a, a char array of these tree pieces, such that the, the union of all those tree pieces is my entire uh, gravity tree. Okay. The size of the, of the, of the tree piece is, is sort of a trade-off between being able to load balance efficiently and having enough work at, each, at, at the lowest level to amortize any communication costs. And typically of the order of, say, a thousand, few hundred particles per tree piece is about where uh, 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 things work out. All right, so you have a say a thousand particles here in the bottom. Uh, the green nodes here represent nodes in the tree which are entirely internal to my given tree piece. Uh, as we go up, we'll get to points where the pink nodes refer to nodes for which there's a copy on another tree piece because there's, this is an external node which is completely on another tree piece. Of course, that tree piece will also have this node because it has a copy all the way to the, to the root. And so these, uh, we refer, refer to these as boundary or shared uh, nodes. There'll be mul multiple copies of that. For example, each tree piece will have a copy of the root. Okay, so uh, you say, well, you know, that seems to be an awful lot of extra memory. First of all, I'm exaggerating here, right? This goes significantly deeper than what I've shown here. And secondly, the, you know, the number of layers up here is essentially going as log the number of processors. So this depth is not growing very fast as we go to large processor count. 
Okay, questions about that? Okay, so, all right, so how do we make these slices uh, in our tree? Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, a very straightforward way, and, and this is a way that's uh, also used by Gadget, is that it's actually possible to turn a three-dimensional volume into a one-dimensional uh, array. And the way we do this is first uh, devised by uh, Warren and Salmon uh, several decades ago is that we can actually hash particle positions into a single number by this special, uh, by essentially bit interleaving. So if I have the xy coordinate system, uh, coordinates of my particle, and I represent them in binary, ones and zeros, I can interleave the bits of the binary. So the last bit of the binary, x, y, z, is encoded here. The next bit is encoded, encoded there. And so we have these triples of bits. And this is a number, right? And this, so one particle, one position, one number. And so as you count through this number, you're actually uh, moving, it, you're, it's a representation of moving through space. And the fact that you have a single number means that I can use a simple sort operation uh, to, uh, to divide my space up. Okay, in general, this idea is called a space filling curve. Okay, the, the, number, the, the, the actual uh, encoding that I just showed you is referred to Morton ordering. Uh, and uh, graphically, it looks like this. Uh, a, a better ordering, and the one used by Gadget, and one uh, uh, Changa has a choice. Uh, of either of these. This one generally performs better. Uh, if you, I say, there's different ways to order space time. The piano Hilbert curve, you can just tell by looking at, so this is a one dimensional curve that's visiting all points in space. This is another one dimensional curve that's vid visiting all points in space. You notice that there's these long uh, diagonal uh, jumps in this curve that doesn't happen in a piano Hilbert. And hence the uh, piano Hil Hilbert's a little more compact. And so to decompose space, you basically take this uh, curve and chop it up into equal numbers of particles. And that defines your, your domain. OK? Is that? Kind of, kind of fun concept, but I make sure everybody, everybody's got it. Okay, so, right, so for example, you know, if I make a cut right in the middle of this cube, I'll be roughly uh, cutting the cube in half. Uh, depending on the particle numbers, it won't be exactly in half. There'll be the the edge will actually have a fractalish, like, uh, uh, topology. Uh, but it, it, you, you can exactly cut your particles into equal numbers, and each will be in a, in a compact uh, domain. The other uh, possibility is actually decompose the domain at some level in your octree. Okay? The advantage of doing that is you won't have a funny fractal cut between your domains. Each domain will be a cube. And so it'll be very smooth, generally giving you less communication, but you won't, in general, have equal numbers of particles. Remember, the octree is not balanced. And so you'll have each uh, oct node will have a possibly significantly different loads, and that makes it more, more, it makes it more difficult for the load balancer to even it out. And then finally, you could do orthogonal rec recursive bisection to divide up your volume. Um, so um, 
This is actually the way gasoline does it. And it, it, as you get to very large particle counts and you have all your particles, say, in a cluster in the middle, you get these, as I showed in the first lecture, you get these domains that are very hard to deal with uh, when you're doing gravity. Um, you, you have all those options available. Uh, again, the, the trade-off is, is between these two, how well you can load balance versus, uh, versus the, the communication. Okay, so you've divided the, uh, your, your computational volume into domains using, say, a space-filling curve. Uh, tree building is pretty straightforward because by putting those, your particles into that hash key, that's actually in tree order. Okay, so you basically sort those hash keys. Um, and I, I didn't point out that if you truncate the hash key, that is, for example, these first four bits of the hash key, that actually defines a volume, okay? That it, it, basically, the volume between this, the rest of the keys being zero and the rest of the keys being one. And that's actually a, those are two corners of, an, of a node in an octree. And is that? Okay, and so, uh, so it's very easy to determine what node you're in by just looking, looking at, the, at the bits here. Okay, so that tree building is quite trivial then. And we can sort of make the uh, similar trick. Once we're building the tree, we can have a separate key where each bit in this point represents a left or right child branch. And so if I have a key that's one, 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 well, that's all left, uh, left branches. Okay, uh, and then of course, uh, you, you build the tree down to the buckets. We talked about the, there's a trade-off there about how deep you want to go. And uh, once you've, you've got the buckets, then you construct multipole moments first for the individual buckets. And then you can merge multipole moments on up the tree. As you encounter external nodes, you send off a, uh, you call a method asking for the external uh, multipole moment. And then when you get to the top, you've got several tree pieces on a processor. You can, within a group, you can uh, merge them all together for efficient intra-processor communication. And then you start the tree walk, okay? The way we do the tree walk, we, uh, we actually separate, so here's a given processor. It has a number of tree pieces. The, these are the charm plus plus objects. Each tree piece actually does uh, two separate walks, a local walk and a global walk. Uh, where the global walk is constantly making requests for data on other processors. But those requests for data don't go directly to the other processor. We first look at a data cache, software cache of data, which if the piece of data we want is present, returns immediately. Uh, if not, it makes a request uh, calls a method, data gets sent back, and then there's a callback that will resume the uh, global work, uh, walk with the new data. And of course, that data is held around in case the next tree piece needs it. Okay? And so that's the, how we do the, the walk in parallel, and sort of parallel in two, two different ways. Each tree piece is doing a walk independently. And then within a tree piece, we're doing, we're actually doing three separate walks. I don't have it here, but we're also doing this SPH walk as well. And then the, a little more detail about that software cache. 
Uh, so we're doing our tree, the remote tree walk. Uh, we request the, uh, the remote node. What the software cache does is actually get not just the node we want, but a whole subtree. Because if we want a node, we're probably going to want its children. And so we amortize that request by doing that. The remote processor sends back the data, and then there's a callback uh, which uh, starts the, which lets the uh, walk know that the, to, to continue. Uh, I mentioned SPH walk, so a similar type of walk for SPH. Uh, generally in SPH you, you have two phases because you need to know the densities because they appear in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, the grad P expression in, in the momentum uh, equation. So you need to calculate the densities first. Uh, we also uh, get the um, the divergence of the velocities because that's needed in the artificial viscosity. So that's one walk. And then once you've got all that, you do a second walk where you're calculating uh, the pressure forces, uh, uh, pressure artificial viscosity forces. How are we doing here? Yeah? So this, this SPH walk, that's how you determine the, the kernel for a particle? Not, not good question. So the, the first time we do the walk, actually, to do the density, we also have to determine the smoothing length. So we determine the distance to the, say, 32nd nearest neighbor or 60th nearest neighbor in that walk, OK? Uh, once I've done that, for the pressure walk, now I already know the distance to the 32nd nearest neighbor. And so that, that second walk is actually a little bit easier because I already know the region I need to search for each particle. This is the, this finding the nearest neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so density is finding the nearest neighbor and calculating density and divergence of velocity. And then pressure is the second walk which uses that information. Good. Uh, and then uh, I should point out that because the forces are symmetric, that cache data actually has to be written back because my force on you is equal to your force on me and you've got to communicate that back to the original particle data. And we also have a, a trick. If I only need to calculate the forces on a small set of subparticles, I just find the density of those particles and their neighbors and the particles for whom I am a neighbor, all right? The inverse nearest neighbor problem. Uh, but that means I don't have to calculate the density for everybody. And so that can be a, a speed up when you only have to calculate forces on a, on a few particles. Okay, and, and just to go review that I've got several, a bunch of strategies for which I'm trying to hide the communication latency. Okay. First of all, you know, if one tree piece is waiting around for remote data, another tree piece can be executing. Furthermore, within a tree piece, if uh, I'm doing a, uh, uh, a remote tree walk that's uh, waiting for data, well, I can be doing either an SPH or a local gravity tree walk. And if I'm doing periodic boundary conditions, I can be doing the periodic boundary conditions. All right, so there's, there's several pieces of work that I can overlap. And then the last thing, you, you can actually specify the priority of the message, which is where they end up in that message queue. And you generally want the things that are providing data to end up in front of the queue so that you can get your data back quickly to continue the walk that is waiting for it. So if you look at sort of what's executing when as a function of time, uh, so what this plot represents is, so time is along the x-axis, uh, percentage utilization is on the, uh, the y-axis, white represents idle processors, uh, black represents uh, uh, communication overhead, and the different colors 
are the different methods that are being executed. Uh, the bluish colors on this diagram are gravity related and the greenish are uh, SPH related and the red and yellow orange are the cache related messages. So we can see as we start, oh, this is the tree build here. There's a little load and balance there. Now this, is, this is on 128 cores, by the way. And so we see we start off, there's plenty of gravity to do, but we're doing this gravity because we're waiting for data to come across the, the network. And boom, here's a lot of data coming across the network, landing, landing in the caches. As that data arrives, then we can start doing both the SPH and the gravity. Uh, the SBH peters out a little bit until the, this is the density walk, this green here. At this point, the density walk finishes, and now this is doing the pressure uh, calculation in SBH. And, and of course, while we're waiting for the density walk, you see the rest of the processors are busy doing gravity. We've got all the information we need for pressure. And then pressure finishes in this uh, um, uh, olive green is actually the, um, the energy equation update. So uh, which uh, this, uh, this happens to be, there's ionization present, so the, the equation of state is non-trivial, so there's actually a bit of work to do to update the energy equation. And that fills in. And finally, we're, we're running out of stuff to do, and everything finishes here. This idle time re represents some load imbalance. And finally, we go and update the particle velocities is what this final green is. And so you can see nice overlap between the various parts of the computation that's enabled by the, uh, by the framework. OK, uh, a little more specifics about that load imbalancing. I mean, we could use the, uh, the, the communication measured by the charm system, but we already have a good proxy for what the communication load is. And that proxy is how close the tree pieces are in space. And so we use that information. Each tree piece sends its spatial centroid to the load balancing system. And so the load balancer tries to use that information to, to divide work across X, Y, and Z boundaries. Uh, sorry, question? Uh, so that we can uh, minimize uh, communication. And, and the other um, uh, specialized load balancer we have, if you use the multi-step LB uh, load balancer, what it does is, you know, what, what's really important is not what happened in the last time step, but the last time step at the same level. That is, if I'm taking a big time step, I want to see what the load was the last time I took a big time step. If I took a small time step, I want to see what the la uh, load is the last time I took a small time step. So I'm using uh, an appropriate load information. And that's what this uh, multi-step load balancer does. Uh, so for the ORB load balancing, just a picture of how that works. This is cosmological simulation of a few million particles. Over on the left, the points here are not particles, they're centroids of tree pieces. So I've got a few thousand tree pieces, uh, each containing, again, a, a few thousand particles. And you can see, you know, they're, they're clustered similarly to the particles, but not, not quite as much. And the color here is the processor number they've landed on. And so, you know, there's a dividing line that the lower, I forget how many processors, I say, let's call it the lower 64 processors are over here. The upper 64 processors contain these tree pieces. And so uh, that's how we divide things up in space. And the, the multi-step load balancing is quite important because generally, particularly if you're trying to load balance this way, because the, um, uh, 
the particles on small time steps also have, tend to be spatially co-local, right? So if you divided, if you just divided it up like this and tried the load balance, so I, here I have a big step and two small steps, right? The work on, on the two small steps are all on the same processors, so you don't get much speed up. You actually have to take those things and scatter them across all your processors. So this is processor number on a vertical axis. This is load uh, uh, utilization in black along the y-axis. So we need to take these things and scatter them so that we can get a significant reduction in uh, computation across a, 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 an entire multi-step. Okay. Um, right. Caitlin's going to tell me to stop. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, all right. So that that's that's the quick overview of of what I use to. Uh, I thought I had a parallelize uh, Charm plus plus, or sorry, parallelize Changa using Charm plus plus. Let me again emphasize that uh, many of those techniques, the SFC, uh, the ORB decomposition, right? These are techniques that I that are used in other parallel codes. They're not unique to this. Um, it, it's just that, right? It, it's just this implementation is on top of the Charm++ system, okay? Uh, and then just a quick, uh, for those of you who want to play with performance, because you have a runtime system, it comes with uh, various tools. Some of those pictures I showed you were done with a, with a Java tool they have called uh, Projections which actually lets you read out what the uh, low, you know, the instrumentation data that the uh, Charm++ uses for uh, load balancing. And you can do that by, uh, in the link, in linking your program, act, add an extra argument, uh, do a short run because it dumps out megabytes of log files. And then you can use those log files. It can be read in using using this uh, Java tool that gives you a couple pictures of the machine of the of what's happening in the machine. Uh, I, right, I've shown you the, this uh, time uh, profile overview once before. Here's here's another one uh, uh, from an earlier version of Changa. Same sort of deal. We've got communication, we've got gravity, and we've got the local gravity. Uh, here I was trying to experiment whether a particular load balancer would help. Uh, I don't have the name. I was going to use greedy load balancing. That greedy algorithm basically takes the biggest chunk and assigns it to the most unloaded processor. And I thought, well, will that work for the tree code? Here's the unbalanced in, in uh, projections. Uh, and here's the greedy load balancer. And say, yes, the load balancing is better because there's less idle time at the end. But projections tells me that there's a whole lot more communication because I haven't taken into account the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the tree locality. So just pointing out the usefulness of looking in detail at your at the execution of your parallel program and you can look into gory detail uh, you can uh, look at individual processors and see what methods are ex being executed and what messages are being sent uh, why would you like to go into such gory detail well suppose you know you're wondering why this method it has delayed in its execution well you can follow the data back and figure out, uh, you know, what what did it depend on? How can I make that happen earlier? And so this uh, the timelines are very useful, although they can swamp you with data. And, and there's higher level tools that help you deal with with all the possible data. Okay, uh, let me just wrap it up. Okay, so in building Changa. 
I've used a number of the, the, the language features. And the top one, is, as I think, is the main one. Being able to overlap your communication with computation to hide latency and do load balancing. And, and there's another uh, list of stuff that I've, I've touched on here. Uh, let me explain a couple terms. Composability, being able to take different pieces, you know, somebody's cooling uh, infrastructure and pull it in. Because it's C++, you can easily do that. Uh, being able to take an MPI program, say you've got an MPI linear algebra solver. It turns out MPI can be run on top of the charm system. So you can compose things there. Uh, and then there's a plus, which I haven't had time to talk about. Um, it, it, this is a very useful system for utilizing GPUs. And we've gotten the code to run on GPUs. And if you want me to coach you through running it on the GPU nodes of Heides, uh, talk to me. And I should stop there and let you guys take a break.